I want to address the structure of this arrangement of Lac Lamond. It's not in a strophic form. In fact, it doesn't even have the chorus. So it just has two verses, an introduction, and a three-measure coda at the end. Everything except for the last four measures is in a very predictable four-bar phrase structure. I'd like to start by looking at measure five or measure 21, depending up. I'd like to start by looking at the second phrase, measure five through nine, or it comes back again, 21 through 25. I guess before we go on, it's important to understand that the students do not have first and second endings like what is in the conductor score. They have everything that has been written out. Okay, so that's why this says A and B, because those are the two rehearsal markers here. So you've got A, which is 16 measures, okay, as it goes to the first end, and B, which is another 16 measures. So rehearsing that might be challenging. I recommend that you number your measures in the score and that you have your students number their measures as well so that you can have a better idea of where you are when you're rehearsing specific spots. I like to number the first time through on the top and then the second time through here on the bottom so that I can be in the same place as my students and can rehearse both ends of the repeated section in your score or for their score. These are different measure numbers entirely. All right, so we have the first four measure introduction which, by the way, is identical to this material here. So we actually play that three times because we play it measures 13 through 21 and then 23 through 34. The, second, um, the first measure of the second ending is identical to the first measure of the first ending, and then we get some variation here, but more or less they're pretty much the same. So this gets repeated three times, and then we start with the beginning of the verse. We've got a four-measure phrase here that ends with a half cadence, and then we have some elision into the next phrase, and it ends with an imperfect authentic cadence. So that makes for a musical period. Okay, Four-bar phrase, half cadence, four-bar phrase, imperfect authentic cadence, and then... We've got another phrase from 13 to 16 here. We end with some kind of a half cadence here. And then the next phrase here ends in measure 20 with a perfect authentic cadence because we have G and, and the first violins here, which is the, and the second violins, and the viols, the, which are all acting as the highest sounding voice. If we look at the first ending, and the second ending, we get a clue to the phrase structure where we start to get uh, tapering into the cadence point. We don't get that decrescendo here in measure three into measure four, but we probably should. There's no reason why we shouldn't be getting softer here. So if we're getting softer here, then what should we be doing in measures one and two? Probably getting louder, right? So we have these symmetrical phrases where we get louder for two measures and then get softer for two measures, and that continues the whole way because the cadential structures are pretty consistent all the way through this. The last three measures don't have that structure, and it's also a unique material. I recommend that you practice these last three measures about three, probably two to three times more than the rest of the piece just because it's unique. If, if you just play it start to finish every single time, the students get the least amount of exposure of these last three, especially if you stop and go back and stop and go back, and then the ending sort of gets neglected, and that's not going to be good. All right, what's the deal with these last three measures? Is it, is it a phrase, what's going on here? If we look at 19, the material in 37 is very similar to what we have in measure 20 and measure 35. The difference is that the moving lines that were in the second violins and violas have been moved to the cello part. 
we have the seventh of this chord and the, have now been moved from the first violins and cellos into the second violins here to here and here to here. The root of the chord, which was in the bass section, has now been moved up to the first violin part. So we have five, seven, and then we keep the common tone and the other voices moved down by step as they should, and we have sort of an arpeggio here with the addition of this E, but we have G, D, B, G descending, and we keep these chord tones here for another three beats. All right, so let's look what happens. We have the end of this phrase tapering down to piano, and then a dominant seventh, so we're going to stress that a little bit, and then what to do about these last two measures into the resolution. Well, everywhere else we have this, we're getting softer. So why aren't we getting softer here? Well, I think that we probably should, and I think that we should probably continue to decay into measure 39, the final measure. And everything also needs to kind of be a, a level down from where it was. The default dynamic marking for all of this is is mezzo forte. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have dynamics. You should be phrasing in every phrase. So the dynamics here are, are not static. And in fact, by definition, dynamic cannot be static. It's dynamic. And we, we get some ideas about where to taper back. But in this section, piano, and then these last three measures here in the coda, I like to treat them sort of as, as an afterthought, like, yeah, we, we've had this before, we're remembering it, and we're like, ah, yeah, that's a nice piece. And so it just tapers back even more until the release. Understanding the structure of this piece can really help you learn not just the phrasing, but how to rehearse it better. You know where the repeated material is, so you know you can rehearse like sections. So the first four measures, and then 13 through 20, and then 23 through 36. As it appears, you can rehearse those three sections back to back to back. Then these larger sections here, you know, as, as these phrases relate to one another, you can rehearse them back to back as well, making sure the students understand where the phrases are. And it gives you an idea that the ending is different and it's going to require more attention. If, if you don't learn the structure of the piece, you might forget about that and you, it might be sort of a letdown at the end if the students don't have enough preparation for those three measures. There are a lot of techniques that your orchestra is probably building right now, and a lot of them are here in Lac Le Monde, and they're introduced in a very cool way that probably aligns with some of the things that you're doing in your classroom, either by rote or through method books. And so I'm going to break those down in the next video so that you can, you can see how these techniques are being used and how to relate the the technique that you're learning in the beginning part of your class to the concert music part of your class towards the end of your class period. Hope you enjoy it.